one of the uh, the reasons for the, the, the setting up of the center um, was to provide a kind of a hub or a focus point um, for the changing city of of, of Dublin, all the, the kind of the, the new languages and cultures that were coming into the, the city. And this, this is something that's often comes upon about, you know, how uh, multilingual and multi-ethnic and multicultural uh, the city has become. Um, but one of the things that's often forgotten um, is the history uh, of uh, multilingualism, the history uh, of multicultural uh, contact uh, in, in, in Ireland. Uh, and in, in, in particular, uh, we often uh, forget about or, or don't know uh, enough uh, about uh, one of the most um, significant of those kind of linguistic and, and cultural uh, contacts and, and impacts, uh, which was uh, the uh, arrival of the French language uh, in, uh, in, in Ireland. Um, so we're absolutely delighted uh, today um, that we can uh, host a, uh, a seminar um, that's looking at one of the most significant uh, of uh, the uh, members of that particular uh, language uh, group uh, in, in Ireland, um, a man who had uh, French as his native uh, language, uh, who spent uh, most, if not his entire uh, life uh, in uh, Ireland, uh, and was someone who would go on to produce uh, translations uh, in French of uh, very great uh, significance. And um, so here to tell us um, about uh, this man, uh, Geoffroy de Lourdes, um, is uh, Keith uh, Bosby. Um, Keith is Douglas Kelly Professor of uh, Medieval uh, French Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin uh, Madison and is a fellow of the Medieval Academy uh, of uh, America. Um, he is the author of, of two um, noteworthy uh, books in, in this, uh, this area, a French in, in Medieval Ireland, uh, Ireland in Medieval French, uh, the Paradox of Two Worlds that Bray Paul's published in 2017. Uh, and more recently, uh, and this bears on the theme of today's talk, uh, the French works of Geoffroy de Watford, a uh, critical edition, which was published by Bray Paul's in 2020. Um, he is a visiting a research fellow here in Trinity College uh, Dublin uh, in the Long Room Hub, where he's working on a new edition and translation of that fabled text for any of us who went through the Irish uh, school system, uh, the Statute of, of Kilkenny uh, and its uh, legacy uh, aftermath and, and, and context. Um, so without further ado then, uh, I would like to uh, hand you over to uh, Keith uh, Bosby. Keith. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, uh, I'm just gonna see if I can share my screen with you. Um, don't tell me if, is that up? Yeah, that's good. Okay, and uh, I'm going to start the slide show. Uh, From beginning, yeah. Oh yeah, there we are. All right. Um, well, although I've been a, uh, I have a doctorate in medieval French, and most of my publications are in that area. I've always been at heart a comparatist, studying uh, the Center for Medieval Studies in York with many Anglicists, and having done some Middle High German, I was always in interested in versions of old French texts and other languages, principally Middle High German, Middle English and Old Norse. When I moved to Utrecht to my first job back before the flood, I worked with Vébé Bale Wim Kenitzer and discovered the corpus of Middle Dutch versions of French works, mainly Romance and Chanson de Geste. Literary histories before, say, 1960 often called such versions translations. But as I began my career, the differences between the French originals and the versions of them produced outside of medieval Francophonia led to the almost universal use of the word adaptation instead. And this became one of the central issues in the classes I taught uh, in the Complet department in Utrecht and of a few publications. So essentially, with any medieval adaptation, especially between vernaculars, we're dealing with the rewriting and uh, modification of usually a French original, with a view to a new audience and or readership with different social, historical, literary and cultural backgrounds and knowledge. For example, 
divine of Hartmann von Auer imbues Chrétien de Troisivin with a more moralistic tone than the Norse even saga, which casts the verse original and the prose characteristic of the native saga tradition. These are both uh, early 13th century, still courtly in the sense that they were destined uh, for reception at aristocratic and royal courts. But the 14th century Middle English Iwain and Gawain is a different kind. It's thought that such English versions of French originals were aimed at the rising merchant class in England, desiring the kind of literature enjoyed by their social superiors, but without the background in courtoisie and chevalerie, which characterizes Chrétien. In essence, as Derek Pearsall wrote, all extended discussions of the moral and ethical issues, chivalric and courtly love, narrators' interventions, monologues and dialogues have been excised, reducing the text to a series of knightly combats. Well, no sex, please, we're British. All that said, uh, medievalists have now begun to use the word translation again, but in the more literal sense of movement from one historical and linguistic place, one latus, to another. And as I understand it, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, this accords generally with modern translation and communication theory. In medieval contexts, we need to distinguish between translations from one vernacular to another, such as Old French to Middle English or Middle Dutch, and those from Latin into a vernacular. Despite the awareness of Chrétien as originator, Hartmann von Auer and others felt free to change his romances, often radically, during the translation process. When it comes to the vernacularization of Latin originals, authors work with an awareness of the historical authority of the language and are much less inclined to modify the base text much. This depends to a degree on the nature of the text being translated, but word for word translation is much more frequent. And this brings me finally to Geoffroy de Waterford. So around the year 1300, uh, the Irish Dominican Geoffroy de Waterford translated and adapted into French from Latin three texts, and you have them up here. The De Exidia Troia of the so called Darius Phrygius, who presents himself as an eyewitness to the fall of Troy. The Breviarium Historiae Romanae Abu Obe Condita of Eutrochius and the Pseudo Aristotelian Secretum Secretorum, which uh, is uh, cast in the form of a letter of. Uh, from Aristotle to his pupil Alexander the Great. All three of these works were well known in the Middle Ages and survive in numerous manuscripts. The De Exilio was enormously influential in the transmission of the Troy story and the vernacular, while the reception of the Breviarium, the potted Rome, a history of Rome, was much more modest, consisting of two French translations only, that of Geoffroy and an earlier version by Jean de Flixcourt from about 1262. Eutropius's text also left traces in vernacular histories of Rome through its incorporation into the Historia Romana of Paulus Diaconus. Both of these texts are concise introductions to the complex subject matter of Troy and Rome. The Secretum, a mirror for princes, was one of the most widespread texts of the Middle Ages, expanded and extended in several Latin versions and translated into numerous vernaculars. Geoffroy's text Texts copied by the Walloon merchant and tax collector Servet Copal survived principally in Paris Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Francais 1822. Here they are. Ceux qui ce livre liront crient pour frère Geoffroy de Waterford et pour Servet Copal qui ce travail en prise de Tépailen. So those who will read, read this book, let them pray for brother Geoffroy of Waterford and for Servet Copal. Who undertook this work and by the, with the aid of God uh, brought it to a conclusion. Um, and here is Servet Corpal, uh, the uh, uh, Walloon merchant and tax collector of Waterford, supplier, and this um, document supplier of victuals to Edward II in the war against the Scots. This isn't dated because it's money owed to Giordano de Bristol, Jordan de Bristol, et Servazio Copale, Provisorio Scriptualium, providers of victuals of supplies to the Lord King in Waterford. And I won't uh, bother translating the rest of it, but this is in some ways an odd uh, uh, collaboration between a Dominican uh, and a, uh, and a, a Walloon merchant and tax collector. Um, 
Now it's clear from the a cursory examination uh, that Joffa's versions of the De Exidio and Breviarium follow the Latin quite closely, while his rendering of the secretal was quite a different sort of enterprise. Um, uh, omitting and rearranging the original, adding and interpolating much material from elsewhere, and altering the model quite radically. Although close to the Latin text, Geoffroy's Guerre de Trois and Règne des Romains diverge occasionally from their sources and are particularly interesting by virtue of their author's choice of French words and expressions to render Latin terms and concepts. Now, a full study of the relationship between the Latin and French versions of the Secretum would be a challenge although I've compiled a good deal of material in the notes to the Secret de Secrets uh, in my uh, recent edition, uh, shameless uh, self um, uh, publication here. And then what follows, I first consider passages omitted and added by Geoffroy to the De Exidio and the Breviarium, and others which he, where he seems to have misunderstood the Latin for different reasons and failed to render the sense accurately. I then look at some instances of his choice of lexis when translating peculiarly in Greek and Roman terms, in the former in their own Latin guise, of course, before examining his use of standard old French formulae already established over more than a century and a half of literature in the vernacular. The last brief section of his paper is mainly devoted to a specific type of change made by Geoffroy to his Latin originals. Unsurprisingly, like many translations and adaptations of Latin texts relating to classical antiquity, Geoffroy's versions medievalize the originals in an attempt to produce something more familiar to his readership. Now, there are very few omissions in the text of the Guerra, but a, four, a small number of editions are worthy of note. On two occasions, Geoffroy uh, feels the need to explain the purpose of funeral celebrations, which he takes to be unknown, unfamiliar to his intended, intended audience or readers. Here's, the, here's just one of them. Um, Achilles arranged funeral games for Patroclus. Well, uh, Geoffroy assumes that his readers don't know, and he explains uh, Achilles' fils made Joe selon présage qui signifiait de la tristesse pour Patroclus. He held many games according to the custom, which signify sorrow and sadness. Uh, for Patroclus. Um, and the text of the Secret uh, also shows that uh, Geoffroy knew the day Ray Militari of Egetius, and two minor additions in the Guerra int at an interest in uh, battle tactics. So Hector led the army out of the city and set it in order. Uh, this is uh, changed slightly. Non de Hector uh, Osmanas on Ospilacite ordinas agent e ses cheres, that's the edition, and his uh, echelons. Um, and here's a Latin lesson. Um, parentibus in Latin, classical Latin, uh, and even in medieval Latin, usually means parents or ancestors. And the sense of relatives is quite rare. So uh, Geoffroy here uh, explains the sense of parentibus. Uh, as le parent's fils et fille, femme, cousin, prochain et amis. Um, and here's a, uh, some misunderstandings. He mistranslates uh, velocem as vieille, so uh, velocem, of course, from velox, um, translates it as vieille from vetulus, uh, meaning old, and there actually is no um, uh, occurrence in French of a word derived from uh, from uh, velox uh, before the I think the uh, the later 14th century. So he's misunderstood this, and he's also got into a bit of a mess with superciliosum, which he takes in a physical description as relating to eyebrows. Of course, well that's what they are, your supercilii. But in fact, the the Latin uh, actually means supercilius in the sense of haughty, but he doesn't. Uh, grasp or doesn't uh, want to translate that, uh, get that sense across. Um, the breviarium uh, is twice as long, roughly, as the De Exidio, as the Greek text, and Geoffroy's modifications are still relatively minor. Many of these are simply missing place names or uh, specifications um, 
uh, or locations. But a contrary example uh, is where he takes Colonia in the phrase uh, Nabonia in Gallia, uh, uh, Colonia deducta est, which means a colony was led out to Narbonne in Gaul, takes it as a place name, Colonia. So he's got Esmur and together they raised war in Cologne, uh, in Ardennes, uh, en France. And um, there are other omissions of detail. Uh, for example, his failure to identify un jovencel, Scipion uh, par nom, the future Scipio Africanus, the son of uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio, reduces the historical importance of the dynasty. And in a whitewashing of Roman failure, he omits the entirely shameful peace agreements concluded by Quintus Pompeius and Hostilius. Mancinus. The, the question I think that has to be asked here is whether this matters. Um, he's writing a potted history uh, of Rome for uh, a readership probably that knows very little, if anything, uh, about Rome. And his, his main purpose is to get uh, the, uh, the principal lines of the, uh, of the, of the rise and fall uh, across to his readers. So this may be literally nitpicking with, uh, with no purpose that I'm doing here, but um, it does in any case show you what he's doing. Um, some uh, omissions, he doesn't, for example, translate the Roman custom of uh, bearing the spoils of war or a stake on his shoulders, Trio from Marcellus, Spoli Galli Stipiti Imposita Umeris Wexit, uh, um, and he omits the declaration of, uh, here of Nero as a public enemy and the binding of his head to a furca and furche before being thrown from the Tarpeian rock. And he fails to mention, this is an interesting one, he fails to mention the massacre of animals at the inauguration of the Flavian Amphitheatre, but adds that what is to become the Colosseum was in place. Où les jeunes chasse pourraient enter toutes choses qui appartiennent à chevalerie. So it was a place where young men uh, could practice anything which pertained to uh, to chivalry. Now his brief uh, additions to Eutropius are usually explanatory. He explains the relationships between individuals, which Eutropius takes for granted. He explains the ranks of Roman uh, 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 civil uh, uh, status. He distinguishes between individuals of the same or similar names. And he can modify also um, uh, uh, things relating to character, motivation, and sentiment, collective or individual. Um, he doesn't like the expression of Roman debauchery. It's unsavory. Caesar's uh, relations with Cleopatra are described as cumqua uh, consuetudinem stupri habeat, with whom he had a debaucherous relationship, uh, which is translated by Geoffroy as qu'il tente à soignant, whom he had as a mistress. In Cleopatra's suicide, Cleopatra sued the after aspidem admisit. She put an asp on herself and died from its venom, but he has, in a very uh, medieval courtly manner, that she died. Pour dolor de lit, uh, for uh, out of uh, sorrow uh, of him. Now, uh, the Latin of the uh, breviarium, which is not as complex as that of um, much of classical Roman literature, is nevertheless more difficult than that of the De Exidio. They have the word difficult there in, in quotes. Um, and consequently, it offers more opportunity for misunderstanding and mistranslation. Many of the errors are in numbers of uh, soldiers, prisoners, uh, age, length of reign, and so on and so forth. And these are things which, um, uh, where, where mistakes are very common uh, in the transmission of medieval literature anyway. Um, uh, but again, they may not be uh, particularly significant for someone who is coming uh, new to Roman history as long as the um, principal lines that come across. Um, he does, for example, he leads to the creation of non-existent figures. He doesn't understand Privignus, a stepson, and so he generates two characters, Tiberius Privignus and Drusus Privignus. Um, he misunderstands 
uh, Aperuit as engender, creating a son of Gordian called Janus Geminus, instead of understanding the sense of Janum Geminum as double Janus. Uh, and so ya, Janum Geminum Aperuit, which means he opened the temple of double Janus, becomes si engendra Janus Geminus. And he fails to grasp the meaning of actuarius as quartermaster and creates a figure, a, a character called actuarius. Now, other um, inaccuracies are uh, semantic. He takes adictatore capitis damnatus, uh, rather literally, uh, which means in, in Latin, condemned to death by the dictator. He's misunderstood it as meaning that Quintus Fabius will be beheaded a capitis, a capitis. And similarly, ultimis poenis, the most extreme punishments, becomes a par dura pena, lossist, and killed him. And there are also errors which mean the very opposite of his text, of Eutropius' text, the home of Lavolsky, uh, located by Eutropius not far from Rome, for those uh, ad companiam aontibus, going to Campania, is rendered as asos qui viennent de Champagne, for those who come from Campania. And Quintus Fabius Nibulanus was too young to have been sent into action, propter aetatum puerilum luci non potorat ad pugnam, on account of young age, he could not be led into battle, according to Geoffroy, pour un grand âge, ne pourrait aller à la bataille, on account of his great age. He could not go into battle. Now, if um, most of these errors, omissions, and misreadings in the text of the Reign are venial, there are just a few, um, uh, such as the, uh, the, the two I've just cited, um, uh, which actually have uh, consequences for the text. Um, it's commonplace of scholarship, in the, on the, for example, on the Roman Antique, which are, of course, the, the 12th century versions of, um, of, uh, of the, um, the Iliad, the Aeneas, and Statius's the Bayard, the Roman de Tra, the Roman d'Aeneas, and the Roman uh, de Terre. It's a commonplace of scholarship on these texts and other adaptations of classical material to state that objects, persons, sentiments, and customs are medievalized and dehistoricized or rehistoricized in an attempt to render them more accessible and meaning to contemporary audiences. And Geoffroy's two classical translations are no exception to this. And I've already given some instances of how he explains unfamiliar aspects of Greek and Roman life and others where he does not um, uh, take the trouble to offer any commentary or explanation at all. A particular uh, interest is, um, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost here, where are we? Um, particular interest is his choice of French lexis to denote characteristically Greek or Roman objects uh, and notions. Hesione, the daughter of Laomedon, is Regi Generis Puelam, a girl of royal lineage, uh, translated medievally as de out parage of high degree in the Gera. Alexander is imperatorum exercitui in the De Exidio, but Chevetain, captain or chieftain in the Gera. In the descriptions of Polyxena, Achilles, and Patroclus, uh, the word dapsilem is translated as bonne vivandière, bons vivandières, and mille France. Um, in the De Exidio, the sense of dapsilem is something like well endowed with positive qualities. But Geoffroy's translations specifically stress generosity and uh, openness of character. Um, the fossam et, uh, is that, no? yeah, uh, fossam et valum of the De Exidio, ditch and rampart, are medievalized as fos et barbacan, ditches and barbacans. Now, Varenne provides richer pickings in this regard, and these examples are a bit more selective. In the Breviarium, uh, Tarquin is credited with introducing drains in Rome, cloacas fetzit, uh, which is translated uh, uh, by Geoffroy as chambre quiet rooms, presumably where you can 
exercise your bodily functions. Um, this is a, would be quiet or secret rooms. Um, almost any expression to do with uh, uh, with mili which has miles or military in it is translated with uh, the word chevalerie, uh, la chevalerie des Romans. Uh, miles, of course, are chevaliers. Magnis copies are grand planté de chevalerie. Strenuae militaris poes de uh, chevalerie. Well, as far as vices are concerned, uh, wait a minute. Uh, yes, um, that first quotation actually belonged to the previous slide. Um, as far as um, vices are concerned, turpi libidine, shameful debauchery of Tiberius, becomes the medieval grand lechery elaine great and vile scurrility, while Caligula's, Caligula's excessively bidine is hors de lechery, foul with lewdness. And Nero is inusitate luxuriae sumptuumque of extraordinary luxury and extravagance in the breviarium, but in the, in the French, plants food de chascune manière de luxure et gluttony, full of every kind of luxury and gluttony. Now, stylistically, the most striking device used by Geoffroy in his translations of the De Exidio and Breviarium is the deployment of synonymical pairs. Um, this kind of pairing is very widespread in old French literature of all kinds throughout the Middle Ages. It demonstrates the richness of old French vocabulary, and it's particularly useful to those writing in verse as it can help create and maintain meter. However, it's not limited to verse and is also common in prose. And such pairings are often found in descriptions of persons. So here we have, um, uh, for example, mente virili, strong-minded, is translated as with two adjectives, lucraja vuit forte bauta, animal simply silagium dipsilem, uh, is translated here by a, a, a double synonymy, sample de bonaire fut de courage, large bonne de l'endiaire, stomachosum uh, is uh, simply angry, astif se corchus quick tempered nunguin, uh, palamides demonstrates multa sua studia, uh, ses estudes esses poesis. Troilus is simply lightus, happy, but in the French he's lies and joyous, happy and joyful. The Trojans waiting, uh, in, excuse me, in ambush in the temple of Apollo, Colla Cantor, they gathered together, but uh, Joffre says uh, that they were repons in richette, they were hidden and concealed. That was those, for example, from the Guerra. Here are um, uh, examples from the Reigne. Um, uh, where are we here? Um, and Eutropius, the word um, described to, uh, used to describe the assault on Milan by Marcus Clodius Marcellus is expugnavit, he took it by assault. He had doubled destriste de roba. Um, Perdomiti defeated becomes vancus in dantes. Cognita eos industria, knowing his assiduousness, becomes la proes et la quantisse. Vir strenus becomes sage bare apros. Floruit flourished becomes, uh, it was uh, uh, ne de richesse, ne de seigneurie, neither for wealth nor glory. And Vespasian's death is caused by profluvio ventris diarrhea, which is doubled as menguisons et flus de ventre, in which uh, Joffre actually is looking forward to a, a section, the medical section of the uh, secretum secretorum, uh, in which he actually also uses these words quite a lot, menguisons et flus de ventre. And on that note, or um, uh, a malodorous note, uh, uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave it except for one uh, slide, and this is really to demonstrate exactly how different um, uh, Geoffroy's 
undertaking of the Secretum Secretorum is from his uh, two uh, uh, Greek and Latin texts. And this is simply an outline uh, of the, uh, the translation of the Secretum Secretorum. Um, so in the prologue and dedication, fine table of contents, which is an interesting feature code ecologically. Uh, there's, a, I think, a study to be done here on the history of the table of contents, because it's not a given. Um, so this uh, section three, the qualities and virtues of a king, that's in the Latin secretum, but it's illustrated by uh, interpolated exemplar from the treatise on the four cardinal virtues. He uses a number of sources here, uh, which I detailed, uh, John of Wales, Martin of Braga, uh, the Golden Legend, Boethius. This is all standard, many of you were reading. Um, Prosper Aquitaine, uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and Aquinas and Erosius. Um, section four on the King's Hygiene and Diet include passages translated and modified from the Liber Dei Conservum and uh, Sanitatia of, of Pope John the 21st and extensive reordered sections of Isaac Judaeus uh, De Dietis Universalibus et Particularibus. Um, uh, and then he returns to the secretum here with modification, takes out, leaves out the cosmological, astrological, and magical aspects of lapidary law. Section five reverts to the, um, to the secretum. And then he adds a whole uh, physi physiognomical treatise uh, by Bartholomeus de Messina, but keeps the short section on physiognomy at the end of the Latin secretum. So you can see here what there are two, really, I don't know what you can call these two models of translation, but certainly uh, the uh, secretum um, is a completely different enterprise to the first two texts. It may be because there is a dedicatee uh, mentioned in the prologue um, of the secretum, unfortunately not named, so we don't know who it was, um, but that may well have had a, uh, an effect on the, uh, on the nature of the translation, and I will uh, leave it there uh, and see if there are any questions or comments. Thank you very much, uh, Keith, for a, a fascinating uh, look into a translator's study uh, in, in 13th century uh, Ireland and the kinds of choices that um, uh, he was making at the, uh, at the, at the time. Um, so um, we've invited um, people to uh, submit uh, questions. Um, if there's a, a point that you would like uh, Keith to uh, expand upon uh, or, or, or clarify. I've got a question that uh, relates more generally to the question um, of uh, French uh, language and French language translation in, in that period. Um, please uh, feel uh, free to, to send a question. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the thing that, um, that I, I don't suppose it should have surprised me at all, given the fact that I was arguing in the in the first book that uh, um, that Waterford was the, really the center of uh, medieval francophonia um, was that um, if we take the Latin originals of the the Deic Cedio and the Breviario and the Secretum and all the material that Geoffroy uses in the in his version of the Secretum Secretorum I think I, that adds up to 13 or 15 sources. Uh, and so it seems clear that what he's doing, certainly in the case of the secretum, is that he's got a whole library in front of him. And he's, when he gets to a point where he thinks he, where he finds something uh, appropriate for uh, inclusion uh, at a particular point, then he, he will reach up and get uh, his copy of John of Wales or Martin of Braga and, and leaf through it until he finds what he needs to put in. Uh, um, this is, I think, a very, it's actually a standard medieval pr procedure, I think, of a, a kind of rhetorical procedure, which the, the, the arts of poetry simply call inventio. I mean, it's the finding, it's the identification of what is appropriate 
for inclusion to uh, to illustrate your uh, to your point. So I think what you know what, what I've been trying to get away from is the notion of Waterford as a backwater. Yeah, uh, that's what's very very interesting about, um, and I think this applies to other languages in, uh, in Ireland in the, in the period, is that the way in which it, it kind of decenters, the way in which you know, literary history tends to get, get written, you know, which is from the kind of Dublin as this kind of center. And then yep. it, it, it kind of, uh, and you, you can see it in the Gaelic tradition as well, that you, you get a kind of uh, a reworking of the kind of the, the literary and intellectual cartography. Uh, of of the country through um, to looking at these these different traditions and and, and how people you know what a center and what a periphery was in in, in, in that period. Um, one of the things, Keith, I, I just do you think? And because certainly one of the things that seems to be borne out by your um, demonstration of this translation practice is what's called in modern translation theory, the explicitation the hypothesis, which is basically the idea um, that translation always seems to involve some kind of explanation. But if, if you if you compare source and, 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 and target, that there is this, this sense of explanation, elaboration, and so on that, that goes on in all kinds of different uh, translations. But I mean, and I was just thinking about that in terms of, um, do, do you think that Geoffroy had a fairly clear idea of, of who was going to read these these translations. <laughs> it was his peers, or uh, in Ireland, or his you know his peers in this uh, wider uh, francophone world. I, I I I can see Phyllis Gaffney there laughing. <laughs> Hi, Phyllis. Um, um, this is a it's a this is a very good. Uh, um, I think we have to go back to the, let's go back to the manuscript, Francais 1822, which I think is very, very close to the date of translation. Uh, from according to the, to the hand, and also there are a couple of historiated uh, initials in it, which have been dated actually to the, by, by Francois Villa's very late, um, 13th century, whereas if I, I think he's a few years out, I think it's around about 1300. And that manuscript has lots of other stuff in it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's got a lot of sermons in it. It's also got Marie de France's fables. And it's certainly dominant. I mean, I stopped short because I gave um, a talk on Geoffroy uh, a couple of weeks ago to the uh, uh, to the I call the bros in St. Saviors, um, the, 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 the Dominicans in St. Saviors. And I stopped short of calling this a, a, a preaching anthology. Um, but certainly there's enough in it to suggest that it may well have been, uh, been used uh, by preachers. I mean, it's not the kind of uh, um, scruffy little manuscript that uh, a preacher might have carried in his uh, in his bag it's it's far if you remember that simply the the, the, the one little uh, snippet I, I showed from it that's far too carefully uh, constructed the manuscript is, is well too well made to be um, uh, used for that but it could have been a um, uh, 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 an exemplar from which uh, scruffy copies were made. Uh, the, what I find still fascinating, unless there is a second Servé Copal, is that we have a, uh, a seem to have a merchant and um, a man who collected tax on the import of wine, uh, moonlighting as a scribe for a Dominican. This is a very, very you know, there may well have been. I suppose they could have been two Selvay Copal, but the, the conjunction of Selvay and Geoffroy in Waterford at 1300 is, 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 is too much of a coincidence, I think. Um, it seems to be kind uh, of biblical appropriateness and, and, and a tax collector should be involved. <laughs> <laughs> this is a kind of business of, of conversion that even tax collectors can be brought to the, <laughs> to the right yeah. side you know, if you uh, deal with them appropriately. Well, you got you have Chaucer, of course, which is, you know, is, is, is a, a related to 
mercantile and his father was a, a merchant. Um, but there is um, just out of just uh, from using a little um, couple of anecdotes, which I think are actually related to to um, to Selve Corpal. One is that there's a section on wine in the Secretum, which is in the Latin, but it's much expanded in the in the French uh, to very specific uh, uh, mention of wines from particular areas of France and Germany and so on. And it also has the famous thing in, in it that this, uh, wine is not made in Ireland because of the climate. Um, and I think these are actually Selve Corpal's tasting notes. I think he was, you know, he was dipping into the barrels when he was in, in, in importing the stuff and, 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 and charging the tax on it, which he then would pay into the, into the treasury in Westminster. And I think he just added them when he was, uh, when he was copying out um, Geoffroy's um, uh, original. And the, the, the second thing which is that I have long been intending to write an article entitled, Yes, We Have No Bananas. Um, because in the, um, in the section, one of the sections taken from uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac Israeli's um, De Dietibus, there's a section on fruits, a section on lots of things, actually on spices and grains and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, Isaac has bananas in there. Je Joffre doesn't. And I'm thinking that Servet Corpal, who imported all kinds of stuff, uh, uh, probably didn't know what a banana was. Because I'd, I've looked up the history of bananas, believe it or not, <laughs> and there's no way that you can pluck bananas, uh, even when they're completely green, and get them to Ireland uh, before they go bad. And, and I, I think there are a number of other cases where he's, he's I mean, this, I suppose, this forms part of the translation. Um, you know, just leave out the things that you're not familiar with. I mean, do, do you think a part of the the success of the Secretum was that it became a kind of a one-stop shop for the yeah. mind in, in, in the medieval uh, period. That, you know, you, could, you, <laughs> you have that in your bookshelf and that's, uh, rather than having a, you know, uh, the, the, the meter long. Oh yeah. Stuff, you know. No, I think that there's, you know, there is a, a good tradition in the, in the Middle Ages of encyclopedic texts. I think, which are in some ways sort of shortcuts to uh, they save you having an in, but they could be, you know, enti almost entire libraries in themselves, but they will, you have everything in, in one place. Absolutely. Yeah. It was enormously popular. It does, it, it, it started out um, uh, in, in Arabic, as germs are in Arabic and then went into Greek and then into Latin. And um, because Joffre at some point, uh, talks about the, uh, the textual transmission beginning with Arabic in what is in fact uh, a commonplace uh, of the time. Uh, you look up almost any um, uh, published mention of Geoffroy um, before Busby. Uh, he's, he's said to, and I think, uh, um, he said to her, uh, you know, he, he knew Arabic and, and Greek. Well, he didn't. Uh, and I, in fact, I got myself into hot water in Waterford when I was uh, um, uh, giving a lecture on the first um, uh, Irish book, The French in Medieval Ireland. Uh, and uh, the authors of a plaque on uh, St. Saviour's Monastery uh, in Waterford, which said in, in bold letters, uh, Geoffrey de Water was Dominican and New Greek and Latin. Um, the authors of that, the text of that plaque were in the audience. And so uh, <laughs> I got myself into hot water. Well, I, I can imagine that, but yeah, it, it's um, a great deal of. And um, Phyllis uh, Gaffney, I think, Phyllis, did you want to, if you unmute your, your microphone, uh, Phyllis? We, we can't hear, can, can you? On, on mute. Oh yeah, sorry, I was there pressing the wrong button. Hello, Keith, lovely to see you. Thank you very much for a, a really interesting um, talk about going right into the details of these texts. There were 
just two places in the list of errors and omissions that you went through. I think it was in the one in the Guerre and one in the Reign, where I noticed what Geoffroy adds is affect. Um, Patroclus feeling grief, Cleopatra yeah. for yeah, sorrow. That's interesting, yeah. I'm wondering if there are many more examples of that and if that could help you to elucidate who his readership may have been. Uh, yeah. I don't know. There, I mean, there are more because, you know, I, given the, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, I have 30 or 40 minutes, uh, I just picked out a couple. Of yes. So there are more. Yeah. Um, so and, I would have to go, this is a very interesting yeah. question, to go yeah. back and see how many there are and uh, to what extent yeah, might it, be. A, yeah, and when we talk to therefore, you're suggesting this might be a, a secular audience, but possibly, or or possibly, it's it's simply an observation that it's something that happens a lot when you go from the rather lapidary, solemn austerity of Latin into a vernacular. Mm -hmm. and for the vernacular audience, you maybe have to add a little bit more color, or I don't know. Maybe it's a, a an observation that can be made about a lot of such translations. I'm, I'm well, that, I mean, ignorant yeah. about this, but it's a. <clears throat> there is, there is. I don't know. To say, I've not really worked on translation as such, but there is, there's a huge project I think being led by a fellow called Claudio Galderisi, who is a is professor at Poitiers, and mm -hmm. he's got a huge series. Uh, published by Bre Brepols on medieval translations. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I haven't looked at it, but he may, they may well be looking at precisely this kind of thing. Um, it might be worth looking at. Right. Yeah. Good to see you. And you, thank you. Mm. I, I just wondered whether um, the, uh, so the, the, the French that's in the, uh, the, the, the text, and, and Phyllis raised that very, very interesting question about, you know, the, how a, a vernacular audience, well, what are, you know, might have potentially influenced the nature of that French, but what about its specific, if you like, geographical qualities? Is there a, is there a sense in which, you know, there are features of um, Geoffroy's uh, French that are kind of identifiably Hibernian? Uh -huh. That was the case then. How is this going to play out when the, the yeah. secretum, in particular, you know, has this kind of European uh, or you know a much broader uh, audience? The um, uh, there is a, 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 a dreadfully dull section in the introduction to the edition on the, the kind of thing where people basically switch off when they get to see the see the words morphology, uh, phonology, and so on. Um, and what essentially what you have in Geoffroy, uh, in all three texts, is um, standard uh, Walloon French of of, of Servais Copal with an underlying Anglo or Hiberno uh, Norman uh, and underlying Anglo or Hiberno Norman features. Unfortunately, no one has yet. I think being able really to pin down um, Hiberno Norman as distinct from Anglo, um, although I think um, uh, Evelyn Morali tried uh, in her um, in her edition of the uh, of what used to be known as the Song of Dermot and the Earl. Um, the interesting thing is that if you take the other texts in that manuscript. Uh, most of them are of continental origin and don't have the underlying Hiberno or Anglo-Norman features below uh, the Walloon. So um, this raises all kinds of, of issues about um, was this text, because it is very strongly Walloon, uh, was it intended for an Irish patron or was it in fact Tended to someone back home for Servé, who obviously, I mean, there are records of him in Waterford, but also uh, a couple of references to him being in um, uh, just outside of Liège in a town called Huy. Um, and he, he almost certainly was sort of going back and forth on merchant ships. I mean, this is a hypothesis. Uh, so he, the, the, the person referred to in the dedication might have been uh, someone back home in, uh, 
in Wallonia. And the, the other caveat I have to, uh, to make is that Copal uh, is, it's not very common, but it's not unknown as a, as a family name in the region. And um, Wallonia is in fact pretty much the center, the area around Liège and then Maastricht, it's pretty much the center of the cult of St. Servatius. So it's not out of the question that there are two Selve Copal. Uh, on the other hand, as I said, the, the coincidence of the dates, I think, is, 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 very, uh, um, is very convincing to me, anyway. I, I think it, um, we, we, we probably have to bring a, a, a seminar to, to uh, a, a close, but I, I think one of the things that, that, that you raised there, Keith, is just the importance of, of maritime communication and that, yeah. all these maritime links. And I, I think that one of the things that has bedeviled a lot of maybe more popular conceptions of Irish history is this kind of overly kind of terrestrial view that basically you start and in, in Athens and Rome, and finally you, you, you stumble to the edge, edge of the world, yes. which is Ireland. Whereas, in fact, if you take a fluvial or, or maritime uh, view of, of the island, then you end up with a very, very different kind of um, mapping of, of influences of, of, of all kinds, um, both in terms of... Yeah, and I think if you look, if you look for example, uh, at, the, um, uh, at the inhabitants of Waterford around about this time, um, uh, there are enormous numbers of foreigners. Um, and I, I was put onto this by a man who has become a friend, Eamon McEnany, who's a, is the who runs the Waterford Treasures Museums, but did a dissertation on the mayors of Waterford. I mean, there are there are people from the south of France. There are obviously people from Bologna. There are lots of people from uh, from from England. There's an entire uh, families of people called Lombard. Um, so it really does look that, it, as you were saying, that the, the position of, of Waterford on the on the edge of the known world is actually belied by by the uh, by the, 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 the mix of uh, peoples who, who are living and working there. Well, I think this is a very very good note to uh, to, to end on, uh, Keith, because I think we we started by, if you like speaking to the relevance uh, of uh, your scholarship to, 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 to how we might link a multilingual present uh, with the multilingual past. And I think that one of the things that um, you've made so graphically obvious uh, uh, this afternoon is just the, the, the range, the extent and, and the, 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 the quality of, of those connections. And I would I have to say um, that we are extremely uh, grateful um, that we have uh, scholars of your caliber um, doing the kind of work which is absolutely crucial, uh, both, I think, for our understanding of the past, but also, I think, of our understanding of the present, and also, I think, how we might construct uh, an inclusive uh, future uh, for natives and, and newcomers on the island of Ireland. Um, so I think on behalf of uh, everyone who has uh, taken part in this fascinating uh, seminar, this afternoon, uh, Professor Bosby, I would I would like to thank you uh, most sincerely, and I very much hope that we'll see you uh, on another occasion uh, here at the at the centre. So, so many many thanks. Uh, thank you very welcome. And if uh, if anyone wishes to discuss this further at any point, I'll be here for a couple of weeks. So don't hesitate to give me a beam. That's that's great. And thanks. So um, for those of you who enjoyed uh, today's uh, seminar, you can go on to our, our website, tcd.ie uh, forward slash literary translation for uh, news of uh, forthcoming events. You can follow us on, on social uh, media. Um, and for those of you who are uh, particularly uh, in, enthused um, by uh, the, the, the seminar and activities, you can become a friend of the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural uh, Translations and support us in uh, our different activities. And again, you can find more details uh, on that uh, on our uh, website. Uh, so many thanks again, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at uh, future uh, events at the Centre. Many thanks. <laughs>